Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. So today I'm delighted to be joined by Be uh, Brett. Brett first. Um, Be Brett. Brett is a, uh, a fellow adoptee and uh, he's, uh, uh, he's a, a therapist and he does a lot of work within the addiction space. So I'm really fascinated to explore this because it's not an area I, I, I know anything about um so i'm welcome to the show brett lovely to see you hey, yeah thank you i really appreciate your time and and having me on um you know i'm always excited to be able to kind of talk about this adoptee addiction change you know all that sort of stuff um because it's not it's not talked about nearly enough in my opinion so um you know i'm not by any means like the be all end all of this topic but i i do love being able to get it out there and get people talking about it so i appreciate the platform to do that brilliant brilliant yeah so um listeners we were talking about you know what's going to be that uh, we had a conversation a few weeks back brett and i um we talking about what's going to be the uh, the focus and what's going to be the title and we looked at something called the cost of change and we thought that's not kind of it's it's not um direct enough we looked at you know if if this was a traditional self-help uh podcast you know we would be saying we call it how to change so this is you know you don't know how to change we do we're gonna tell you and and that kind of um yeah basically lying often kind of like the falsehoods and so we came up with uh we, we came with this title of how we change so it's going to be more of a, a an an exploration. We're going to look at it from a, a, a this specific lens of addiction, but we're not. We're going to look at it through other stuff as well because we don't want to make it a pure uh, addiction special. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Tonight we've got an addiction special with Simon Ben. You know, it, it's not really my my thing. So, um, how we change? Uh, yeah. I think one of the things is people say we change slowly, don't we? Um, <laughs> sometimes, but sometimes that's not always the truth. That that's not always the truth. So how how we change is about the, the mechanism that happens, the insights that we have, the amount of time that it takes. What's what's your take on this, Brett? Let me open it up up to you because you're as a I, I, I'm just a, a guy who likes being coached and has learned a little bit about that um I'm not a therapist like you said I mean I think at the base level it's it's important to kind of to understand that in human nature there's often a very large gap between uh what I call like want and work there's there's a there, there's, there's often a desire to change and an understanding to change and a logical understanding that, you know, there's things around you or in your life that, that you would like to change and need to change and again, want to change, but the work required to do that is often, is often daunting. And we don't know why, um, because oftentimes the, the change that we want to make is going to make our lives easier and more positive and all that sort of stuff. Right. So why wouldn't we make that change? Why wouldn't we put in the effort? Um, a lot of it has to do, you know, with safety, right? Even if we are in, you know, this awful, terrible, miserable state or whatever it is, and we talk about like the far end of the spectrum, it's still familiar. It's still known. Um, it's still something that, you know, we'd rather take the devil we know, um, because we know to take addiction, right? Um, addiction doesn't make logical sense. Why would you go out every day and use a drug and you know that it's bad for you and all that kind of stuff? Um, but you do know how your day is going to go more or less within a certain number of factors, right? You're going to go out, you're going to use, you're going to feel crappy, and then you're going to feel better when you're high, and then you're going to feel crappy again, and then you're going to da 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 right? So everything's kind of contained in the bubble of being in your addiction. And that is familiar. It may not be happy or contentment or whatever, but it's safe more or less mentally, right? It, isn't, it doesn't ask anything of you. You've already lived that life. You know how to be that person. On the opposite end, to, to move forward, to stop doing that, to go to school, get a job, have a career, have a life, have a family, all of those big, great, wonderful things, that can be scary as hell because that's, that is something that is unknown. 
So we often, and that, that's just a, that's a big example, but as humans, we generally take the devil we know versus the devil we don't, even if, you know, the other one is arguably and objectively and logically more positive and better. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of theories as to why, but, you know, at the core of it, change is difficult for us because we can't predict the future. Um, as much as we would like to, we don't know how things are going to go. Um, so we'd rather stay in the thing that we know how it's already going versus the thing that we we don't know how it's going to go. And that, that speaks to like our basic evolutionary need. Um, that's your strongest, that's your strongest drive more than procreation or sex or anything like that. Your strongest drive is to stay alive. And so without lions and tigers and bears in our world anymore, roaming around trying to kill us and we have to fight for our food and all that kind of stuff, we translate it to safety of emotional things, um, safety and environmental things. Um, and so we try and preserve that safety as much as possible, often to our own detriment. Um, so that is one of the biggest reasons why change can be so difficult um, is because we don't know what's going to happen if we change. We do know what's going to happen if we stay the same, even if it's bad, but we know what it is. Yeah. So some people, the, the word that came to my mind really was uh, as the opposite of safety was in this regard, was curiosity. So I, staying, staying stuck or the, 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 there's kind of like the staying stuck and, or, or the, as the, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to fight my, my stuckness. Um, and then somewhere in between that, there's like a, a gentle curiosity. Um, okay, so what would be what what would it be like if? Um, so there seems to be three little forces there at play. Um, what do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, I think even the curiosity is can be driving, but it also can be something that makes you feel even more stuck sometimes. You know, where we say like. You know, I could spend all day thinking about what would it be like if I made this career move or if I, you know, changed this thing up or if I called this person that I haven't talked to in 10 years or, you know, all this kind of stuff, right? We have these ideas of, of like, what would happen, right? Humans daydream all the time. We think about, like, what could be, what could be, what could be. Um, but at the same time, that can also be because we can, it, it's almost like the positivity compared to what we're currently doing makes us that is a very simple term but you know like when we say like oh i could be doing this but i'm not that gap between like what you could be doing or the curiosity and all that kind of stuff if you don't act on it can also become more debilitating at the same time because you're like oh i'm this piece of crap um you know i'm not doing those things i could be doing those things but i'm just kind of trudging through life da, 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 da. and there's a very fine line between like curiosity in wanting to do something and going and doing it and curiosity and wanting to do something and not doing it and becoming depressed because you can't do it or you don't have enough insight or you don't have enough motivation or coaching or skills or all these things um you know that we teach in therapy but not everyone's privileged enough to go to therapy or has gone to therapy or has a good therapist um or coach or mentor or whatever um to learn how to do these things right because there can be blocks that stop you from uh, capitalizing on that curiosity you could have adhd learning issues uh depression anxiety all these different things that stop you but you never got words for them you never were taught what they were you never were taught how to deal with them all these different things so there's a very fine line between like action and wanting action but becoming sad depressed anxious whatever because you can't take that action or you're not taking that action um we're often two minds about things yeah two minds yeah that's that's what it's all about isn't it two minds with that there's that the the logical mind and then there's the um illogical mind the the, the deep mm -hmm. stuff it, that, it, that yeah the, the emotional one right like it's it's that emotional mind and to this day, I've been doing therapy for a little while now, and I, it still blows my mind that we can argue with ourselves, um, that we can have, we can debate ourselves about things. Like you're one person with one brain. What is that about? Um, it's crazy that you can, that you can argue with yourself about things, that you can convince yourself, you can trick yourself into believing things that you know aren't true. Um, because we have those two minds. We have that logical advanced mind and then we have the caveman emotional mind. And those two things are trying to live in a world 
um, that wasn't that isn't designed to cater to both of them. Um, it's really designed to cater to neither of them, um, and we're just trying to navigate it. I I firmly believe humans were never meant to be as smart as we are. Um, it was a a grave error to move out of the caves. We would have been much happier. Um, and that's that's been shown even like in studies. It's it's true that it, it that the more intelligent you are, the higher your IQ, the more likely you are to be depressed. And the more severe your depression is going to be, and the harder it is to treat. Um, you know, with intelligence comes negative things, and often it's because we can self-evaluate. We can see exactly what what's going wrong, how we're doing, what we're doing, how it's counterproductive. Da, 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 right. So, in therapy, the goal is to kind of meld those two things together, become okay with how our brain works. You know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah. The, the the thing that came to my mind on that was um, uh, in terms of like brain damage stuff as a, a, a real type A uh, Olympic Olympian guy here in the UK called um, Cracknell, James Cracknell. So he won Olympic golds in rowing, right? Um, and he yeah, he's an Ironman triathlete, this sort of stuff, right? And it, he he got knocked down by a truck in the in the states, and he knows he's got brain damage, but he's but he he still seems to trust what's going on in his brain, and you know, and I, I, I and that's what came to my mind when you talked about intelligent people suffering more because they kind of they believe their own stuff more. They they. Mm-hmm. they the, the, the well, it's, it's, yeah, the, the rationalizations become much, much more complex, right? So everyone rationalizes. We do it all the time. Uh, little things here and there. But then as we get to kind of bigger rationalizations, you know, more things about how, how we perceive the world, how we believe, all that kind of stuff. Um, a rationalization is something that our brain does in order to convince us of something, to do something that we know that we don't want to do or shouldn't do. Sometimes that can be helpful, right? You can rationalize yourself into the all right, fine, I'll go take in the trash now instead of waiting until tomorrow because da 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 right? But I don't want to do it, but I convince myself that I should do it, and then I do it. The flip side of that, which is where people use it even more often, is to convince themselves of doing things that they know they shouldn't be doing. Um, take addiction, again, for example. We see here all the time. There's all sorts of rationalizations. Oh, I can manage. Oh, it's been fine. Oh, it wasn't that bad, da 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 da, da right? Um, but the more intelligent the client is, uh, the harder it is to deconstruct those things. Um, you know, I'll take, I'll take 50 average intelligence clients over five hyper intelligent clients um, because it's just so much smoother and there's a lot less questioning and fighting and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, that is like the curse of humanity. Even the most average or below average intelligent person is still far and above, you know, the cavemen. Um, and so, you know, we still have to struggle with those things as humans, um, when it comes to, to moving forward and, and you're right, like our brains are, our, it is us, right? So it's very hard to separate ourselves from it, right? So even if you know that you have brain damage or something that is altering your reality, it is very difficult to ignore those things because the one source of truth that you've ever had in your life, which is your brain and your perception is now telling you something different or is telling you whatever it's telling you. And so it's very difficult to, to ignore that. Um, you know, oftentimes when you see like schizophrenia, that sort of thing, um, at least in the early stages, they know what they're saying is it, it doesn't logically track, but it's very hard to ignore, right? We only have one brain. We only have one source of reality. We only have one version of us. It's constantly changing, but we only have one source of ourselves and that's our brain. Um, I remember a few years ago, my daughter's now six, but when she was about three, um we were reading books about the body and the nervous system and all that kind of stuff and she was like okay so how does my brain know what to tell my body to do and it was like there was this whole it took about a month and she would ask new questions every day and you could see the little wheels turning until she like finally understood she's like so i am my brain and i was like yes and then she still had more questions after that so it's it's like an it's a very weird concept right that um that's our one and only truth or a truth detector, basically. And when that goes haywire, or when we push it in different directions, it can change a lot of things for us. Um, it's very hard to separate ourselves from that. Yeah. So you, you talked about you, you talked about safety. Is there, uh, earlier on, and familiarity. Is there a link here, you know, 
we're into we're talking about the adoptees as as adoptees is 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 there something to do with adoption adoptees not not feeling safe and therefore mm -hmm. craving more safety so our propensity to crave safety is stronger and and and, and that's why we get more addicted to something is is that what this is about i, I don't know i'm I, i've heard a lot of, I've, I've heard a, a lot sure. of talk about the fact that adoptees are overrepresented in in addiction yeah so they are um adoptees are about twice as likely to become addicted or to become addicts as non-adoptees which is a pretty huge number right twice as likely um at least in the united states it's kind of an old number from like 2014 ish there's about a little under two million addicted adoptees in the United States, um, which is a pretty significant, pretty significant number as well. Um, but yeah, you know, adoption is a trauma. Adoption is a trauma regardless of circumstance, right? So even if you have, there is no like perfect adoption, but let's say that you were born and your adopted parents are right there, adopted you at birth, took you home. It was, it was a transition, right? It was, it was all right there. Everything was done. You knew from the time you could conceptualize that you were adopted, all that sort of stuff, right? That is still a trauma, right? That is still a trauma. There can be, there is a, a spectrum of trauma, right? Um, but it's all subjective, right? It's, it's that trauma is going to be different than someone who ended up in foster care for a couple of years and then was adopted or, you know, live with bio family, but then had to be adopted. You know, there's all these different unique circumstances around each adoptee. But adoption is a trauma in and of itself. That's the starting point because there is a separation there. Um, by default, there is a separation. There is a break in, you know, call it chemical, you can talk, call it the oxytocin connection, you can call it whatever, but there's a break. Um, and that break is a trauma. What you do with it or how it affects you varies widely from person to person. Um, but the idea of like seeking safety um, because of it, that becomes something tricky, right? Because a lot of adoptees learn that attachments are not safe. They're not stable, right? Because we have that initial belief that our first attachment didn't stick around. So the idea that attachments aren't safe, and not every adoptee has this, but a, a majority, at least the ones that I've worked with over the years, um, have this underlying belief that they don't really understand, but they have it, that attachments aren't safe. However, it is one of the most basic human needs to have attachment, right? We need it just as much as we need food and water. Um, we don't develop properly without it. Um, all these different terrible things happen if we don't have um, proper attachment or any attachment at all. Um, and so, you know, as we do this uh, and as we try and seek out safety in others, which is our basic way of as humans of seeking safety is to get outside of our heads by connecting with other people. And we find ourselves unable to do that or are too afraid to do that on a deeper level. Um, we don't have the same ability for safety as other people do, as non-adoptees do initially, right? That's what's important. It's not something that's permanent. You can learn how to, you can develop an ability to have healthy, full attachments to other people. Adoptees are not permanently damaged in this aspect. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of talk in the world. There's a lot of old, old, old research that says like, yeah, maybe they are, but you are not. You are not enabled. You are not permanently damaged in a way that you cannot connect to another human person in a real healthy way. Um, but yes, there is that seeking safety piece. Is that the factor that impacts uh, the increased addiction in adoptees? Maybe. That's the answer that we, that's the only answer we can get with adoptees and addiction is maybe or possibly, right? They've done huge studies, like 18,000 person studies um, to see what would influence the increase in addiction in adoptees. And they looked at everything they could think of and they got nothing. Um, not that they got nothing. There was just no one factor that stood out more than the others, right? So it could be biological parents were addicts. So you have the genetic predisposition to be an addict, right? It could be age of adoption, uh, SES status. You know, there's a million, they studied like a hundred different factors and not one stood out enough, which I think is, is kind of beautiful in its own way, right? Adoptees are unique each time. There's some grand themes, right? Um, but they're unique each time. And so the story is going to be different each time. 
So we kind of have to accept the fact that like, yes, they are twice as likely. Let's see how we can help them. And that's kind of what I focused on is like, cool, we know they exist. What can we do about it? Yeah. So we are talking about statistics here. Um, and and yeah, we are just, you You are one person. I am one person. So we're, the, the, um, the, strange, the strange thing was, uh, I'm going to, I'm trying to, Come up with a better aside to the a better um, story about this. I can't. I can't do it. But I'm gonna. I'm gonna relate this to a, a business guy, a, a guy, a, sort of a friend of mine. He was considering a, a, whether he he should open a new kitchen showroom, right? And and he's hearing that he's hearing that the economy is going to go bad, and therefore he, you know should he or shouldn't he do it, and. It's like you, you can just overthink that. Um, and when when I, I we were in a like a peer to peer coaching group, right, mentoring group, and I said to him, "Well, what's your what's your conversion rate at the moment between the number of people that come to your showroom to buy a look at buying a kitchen and how many people buy a kitchen from you?" And he was going, "Well, I don't know." I said, "Well, that's the place to start." Mm -hmm. focus your effort on what you can control rather than going mm -hmm. into some some massive overthinking about the statistic about the you know the statistical probability of um of um whether things are going to work out it's like we are just one we're just one person and when you're looking at the statistics you're talking about as you said 18 thousands of people so it, it there is there is no yes or no. It's it's about us and what we do here right in in the moment. We don't need to worry about what probabilities are or what the population as a whole is going to be. It's about what it's about us, right? And a hundred percent. Yeah, and and there there's a quote that I heard a long time ago, and I have no idea where it's from. Um, but it, it was talking about statistics, right? And it said that you can predict what the average man can do, but rarely does a man act in an average way. So we can have these broad strokes. Um, but you know, until I sit in a room with a client, uh, until we kind of parse out that story or see how they feel or that sort of thing, right? Like, yes, I have my broad strokes. I have my evidence-based interventions and all this kind of stuff that I've built up over the years. Um, but that only matters so much until you start talking to the person and see how it affects them. And then you kind of feel it out from there and, you know, do all the, all the mixing and everything after that. So yes, like we know they exist, but the practicality of how to treat them um, is, is, or, or what impacts the severity of their presentation, all that kind of stuff. I, when I did my own research on what present, what, what I thought might impact the severity, I got pretty much nothing. It, it, what, what I was looking at the relationship to biological parents or the idea of them. Um, and the answer was like, eh, who knows? Uh, it just kind of varies. It varies wildly. And again, that's what's working with adoptees is like, that's, that's what it is. Like we are, adoption is a piece, a, sometimes a very important piece, sometimes not a very important piece, but it is a piece of our story. But humans are infinitely varied and always changing, right? Every second of the day, we're changing in little tiny itty bitty microscopic ways um in our in our psyche i'm not talking about biologically um uh, but also that um and so to try and pinpoint that um is is not going to be possible right all we can do is broader that's why i love psychology so much is that you know we're not this like hard science of you know like physics if you drop a pencil it's going to fall the same way in the same rate every time psychology is different we get the broad strokes but then there's there's the art to it um there's the art of managing or helping or conversing or learning about other people um that's personally what keeps me engaged and that's what i love the most um but it's kind of indicative of the process overall and we talk about adoptees there's even more variance there okay uh interestingly i did a uh, you know like a, a course in psychology at university and i didn't fall in love with it like you did right i, I found it really frustrating which is an interesting, interesting way to look at it you know um so the, the the how we change things um uh, we talked talked about the uh, we talked about the time 
thing. And and society says, generally, society says change is hard, change take takes a long time, um, and it. Uh, I I think that that oh, I was going to mention this word uh, uh, early earlier on to you this this phrase confirmation bias. So. Mm. Um, can you give us? I mean, I've got a, I've got a kind of a view on what that is, but what what what's confirmation bias? You heard so that? confirmation bias is is when you basically see what you're looking for. Um, so if you go out, you know, thinking that you that you something's going to be the way that it's going to be, you're most likely going to see it as that way. So if you uh, go to a party and you've never met any of the people there before and you're like, oh, all these people suck and they're going to be rude and all that kind of stuff. When you walk into the party, you're more likely to see or pick out the specific rude or this or overestimate or over-exaggerate, you know, the different characteristics because you went in with that idea. That kind of goes back to like the fear round change, right? We want to be able to predict things. It's a safety mechanism. We want to be able to know what's going to happen next. That's impossible. Um, we can't know what's going to happen next. So we try and do our best to predict what's going to happen next. But that often puts us in a trap of only experiencing what we think is going to happen because we put so much effort into thinking about what's going to happen next. Yeah. Um, so we want to just kind of live in that. And then it kind of helps us maintain the status quo, too. Um, you know, that's part of where, you know, I do a lot of my work is in like authenticity. Um, and a lot of change, change becomes a lot easier when you can become more authentic, but the real trick, and this is like the, this is the, the greatest secret that I have, um, for, for change or for feeling more okay with yourself is that authenticity isn't about finding yourself. I think everything that says like, go find who you are and, you know, I don't want to piss anybody off with this, but like finding yourself is such a toxic concept. Um, because like I said, we're always evolving, we're always changing. So unless you were to lock yourself in a sensory deprivation tank for the rest of your life, you're gonna experience things that's always changing you. So that definition is always gonna change and you can't define yourself anyways. But the real trick, and here's the secret, the real trick to being authentic is finding out who you're not. Take that away and all that's left is you. And then you don't have to worry about defining yourself. Just worry about who you're not. And you know, if you sit around and think about it long enough and experience things and keep track of yourself, you know who you're not and you take that away all that's left is you and when all that's left is you and your authenticity you're able to receive those new experiences that confirmation bias goes way down um it's never going to go away totally right we're still human um but it goes way down you're just able to kind of be in the moment that's the definition of authenticity is presence in the here and now so being able to be in the moment to be engaged um and to experience things as they are and have an understanding of where like you end and the world and the game and the social experience begins. Um, that's like the greatest thing, right? Having that authenticity. Um, but that's the trick, figure out who you're not and take that away. Okay. So one of my favorite subjects here, the, the who we are not, yeah. who we are, right? So, how, uh, I've got a take on this. Um, in in uh, and essentially the the take is that we are not our trauma. Mm -hmm. So if you if uh, the the metaphor I often use with this is that the have you have you seen me doing this with the diamond in the fist? What, no, no. So this won't work on a podcast, listeners. It won't work anymore than <laughs> when I did it last time, right? But Im imagine, imagine a clenched fist, and the clenched fist is a is a metaphor for the trauma that that we've that we've been through, um, and as uh, as Brett's talked about. Um, Oh yeah, I've uh, you know when I was saying Brett, uh, Brett, or Bet, Brett or Bet, I I've got a, a, my my wife's my wife's auntie's called Aunt Bet. I'm, I'm, I was wondering <laughs> why, why make, what's what's going on in my head, Bet or Brett? I know that I'm talking to Brett. Brett looks well, very the, different. You know, Freud for, for, for would say you very much want me to be your aunt. So oh, okay. you know, there's that. <laughs> right, that's that's a rabbit hole. Let's not go down for your rabbit hole. So um, the the fist is the metaphor for the trauma. 
and then uh, and I and I and I hold that up to the screen. That's what I'm holding up to this to the screen, and. Um, <laughs> In, inside inside that fist is is the uh, the, the the diamond I've got a, like a glass diamond here that I got off Amazon for like nine dollars six quid or something like that. Um, so the 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 the, the, um, the 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 glass diamond represents the truth of who we are, and the trauma represents um, who we are not. So we are not our trauma. So rooting around in the trauma. We're not going to find well, yeah. The, we are going to if if we root around in the trauma, yeah. We are going to. The, the trick is 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 to find the the identity, who we are underneath that trauma. So we're we're not our trauma. So you know what we are not. We are not our trauma. We are not our confirmation bias. Um, we are not um, our thoughts, our feelings. We're not our uh, beliefs we're not our self-limiting beliefs we're the thing that's left <clears throat> after all those mm -hmm. have have um been put to one side now that that's 14 years of study um and curiosity summed up in, in a kind of a hopefully a neatish con concept that, that I spent two minutes describing, but to me it's not that's not just a theoretical idea in my head. That's that's my belief in in my bones, right? So it's not mm -hmm. even like a feeling in my heart. Mm -hmm. It's a belief in my bones. It's like an embodied mm -hmm. thing. So. What, what, that's my take on who we are not. What, what's your take on this from, from, from something that, from a guy well, who and, clearly knows far more about this stuff than me? Well, I mean, I, I, I love that metaphor. And, and I think it's, and, and, and I feel the same way about like when I talk about authenticity, it's something that, that I had to come to really believe for myself and understand. And that's why I believe it so strongly is I feel it in my bones too. You know, it's, we are not any one thing. We are never just something, right? When we, when I talk about authenticity, right? Like, I can't, or like, who, who am I, right? I can give all these answers. I'm a father, a therapist, a director of this. I'm a guy on Zoom talking to someone across the pond, also on Zoom. You know, those are all things which are true. They're not, they're not wrong, but they're not who I am. I could spend the rest of my life writing a list of all the labels that I have for myself. And none of those things, that list will never encompass the experience of being me or the way other people experience me or the way that I experience the world, you know, all those sorts of stuff. Right. If we look on the scientific side of things. Um, depends on what study you ask, but scientists estimate that we experience between four to four hundred billion bits of information per second. Right. We filter out ninety nine point nine 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 percent of those. Right. But we are still processing through and filtering through. Let's go on the low end. Four billion bits of information per second. Right. So we are constantly being impacted by the information we are receiving. Um, like I said, in small ways, usually, sometimes in big ways, depending on what it is. Um, but to say that I am this one thing, that might be true for the one second where you say it, but it's going to change the next one, and the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one, all the seconds that make up your life. So to, to say that you are any one thing or even a multitude of things is always going to be inaccurate. You can't be a list of things. You can only be that diamond in your fist, right? And even that diamond is indescribable. Um, but you know, there's there's always going to be that that shiny content self um, underneath it all, um, and it's there. A lot of clients are like, "Well, what if I take away all these things and there's nothing there, or I don't like what's down there?" Well, that's not possible. One, there is something there. You spent your whole life building it. You just don't know it. Um, and two, you're not going to not like it because it's you. you it, it, by definition, you can't dislike it. And if you do, that means you're not being authentic. Um, it can be scary. That's different um, than not liking it. Um, but, you know, it's it's 
as we strip away all those things, we strip away the meaning behind those labels or the or we get to choose, not strip, choose is a better term. We get to choose how much we want all these things to impact mm -hmm. us um, or how we want to respond or, you know, how we want to experience all these things. Um, that's kind of where like the real mm -hmm. authenticity in, in the who we are not comes from. And it becomes a, a more automatic process the more you practice it. Um, which is, which is the most important once you kind of feel that. Um, and I think a lot of the, the, who we are or who we're not comes from like this pursuit of happiness idea, right? Everybody wants to be happy. Sure. Um, you know, and we're taught, I, I think, especially in America, um, we're taught like this pursuit of, it's, it's in the thing. It's, it's written, in, it's written in ink, the pursuit of happiness. And, you know, we should always have these things and, you know, you're going to find it one day and all that kind of stuff. I personally think like that happiness thing is is not overrated, but it's it's like toxically unattainable at all times. You can definitely have times where you're happy. That's great. But I think being content is severely underrated. Um, to be able to be content and be okay in any given moment and then kind of ride whatever comes after that, that's what authenticity is about, is the ability to be content in those moments. Um, so finding out who you're not, taking that away, allowing yourself to be content and not worry about the things that you are or are not, right? Those problematic shoulds. I should be this. I should be that. I shouldn't be this. I shouldn't do that. Um, that's kind of where that, that diamond comes from. Yeah. Have you, um, have you heard the, 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 um, the truth that there is no one Facebook? Have you heard that? No one Facebook. There, there is no one Facebook. So we, we, we. It's a, it's a metaphor. You said there's, there's no one of us because we're constantly changing the four billion, uh, yeah, data bits and all that sort of stuff. The, the metaphor that came to my mind. There is no one Facebook. So at, at any one time, I don't know how many, how many, probably Facebook's got like a hundred thousand people working for it. I don't know, but. Uh, their techies are at any one time running like I don't know 20,000 200,000 5 million they're running a million and one experiments to see how they can adjust the algorithm how that tracks mm -hmm. for their user retention how that tracks for their money because you know now they're you know they're floated on the stock exchange so um uh, all they all they want is higher profit. So the whole thing is about more more ad views, more people looking at more pages, so that they can sell them more adverts, so that they mm -hmm. can get this thing. Right. Now. So there isn't any one Facebook because it, it it's it, it it's it's not a static thing i'm looking i'm looking at two things here i'm looking at a glass that adds some water in and I, i'm looking at a a, a, a mug add some tea in right that mug doesn't change but um we change all the time on your basis of what you're saying and i never heard of it expressed that way before and i think it's beautiful and powerful and facebook there's no one facebook facebook is, is, is changing is changing all the time so it we can't pin ourselves down like the pursuit, the pursuit of who we are is going to leave us. Well, it's going to wrap us around the twist, aren't they? We're going to wrap around the axle yeah, it, because it's, con it, it's it, in a constant state of flux to use your. Yeah. And, and even, even to tie it back to like the perception piece, right? Like no, no two people perceive things in the exact same way. You know, even if for, for any one event that involves two people or more, there's more than one truth about that event. Um, it's not the same every time. There's even evidence that shows that we perceive people to be taller or shorter than they are. I think it's like up to plus or minus two inches based on how much social power we feel they have. So if you're in a room with someone who's the exact same height as you and you feel like, and it's like the president or whatever, you're going to perceive them as being taller than they actually are um, if you were to draw it out. Right. So our perception, things that we hold as absolutes, like someone is only exactly in this amount of inches tall. Um, you know, there's that doesn't even hold true in our perception of the way we see the world. So the way that we perceive things from person to person varies wildly as well. Um, and it's supposed to, 
even that mug, if I was looking at the same mug of tea on your desk, you would see it differently than I would because you have a history with that mug. You know, you have all these things that impact the way that you see it and handle it and hold it and all this kind of stuff, right? I've never seen it before in my life. Um, so we would notice different things about it. We would perceive it in a different way. Um, so that's, that's always, that perception is always impacted by our experiences in the world as well. Yeah. Um, I want to go to the time issue on change. And, and you know, the, I, I was talking earlier on about society tells us that um, change takes time. Society tells us that change is hard. Um, so what doesn't doesn't that make the whole thing harder? The the fact that we're culturally conditioned to believe this stuff is hard. You know, I think it's I I can't speak for like uh, UK culture, but at least in American culture, we're taught that you know, change is, you should always pick yourself up by your bootstraps and push forward and more and more and more and capitalism and whatever, uh, which ironically the pick yourself, up by, pick yourself up by your bootstraps saying was originally intended to talk about like dumb people who are trying to get something impossible because you can't literally pick yourself up by your bootstraps because they're on your feet. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but we, especially in American English, like to take sayings that used to mean something stupid and try and make them seem like something noble um but that's one of them anyways um you know we're, we're taught that like yes it's hard but that's what makes it worth it um which is true to a degree right if something is super easy and like free it loses value right uh but when you kind of hit that authenticity point you don't really care about how much effort it is or that sort of thing it just becomes like this fluid process and you make the change because you want to make the change and that is part of it, right? Separating yourself from the problematic shoulds of society, which say this should be hard or you should always do this or you should always have A's or you should always be first or, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, when you separate yourself from that and do things because authentically you want to do them and it's separate from what you feel like you've been told or you've told yourself that you should or shouldn't be or do or all that kind of stuff. That's where the change becomes a lot more fluid. That's where it becomes more in real time. That's when you're acting out of a place of who you are, which I still don't like that term, but who you are, as opposed to I'm trying to meet this expectation. I'm trying to meet this, like keeping up with the Joneses sort of thing. Yeah. The um, what what are the biggest as you've been on your uh, journey so far, what have been the biggest things that have helped you change? Honestly, just being content with being content. That was, that was the biggest thing for me. I spent a lot of my life, I still have anxiety, but you know, with a lot worse anxiety, um, just a lot of questioning and predicting and worrying and shoulds and all this kind of stuff. And thinking that there was supposed to be some like cloud parting, I'm happy now moment where I'm just like skipping on rainbows for the rest of my life. That's not real. Being content with being content and being okay with like saying, yeah, I'm content. I, I can still want more, but I can also be content with where I am. My contentment is not based on me having more things or being more of this or being more of that. I'm doing those things because I want to do them. Um, not because I feel like I have to do them or I should do them. Um, at least for me, that that being content with being content was one of the biggest like changes for me. Yeah. Um, and it kind of just came across like as I was learning about this, learning about myself and how can I manage this. It wasn't like a big cloud parting moment. It was sort of like passively. I just kind of came to this idea until it clicked. And I can't tell you when it clicked. Um, it just did. Um, but it took a lot of time, a lot of internal dismantling um, to to get to that point um of being okay with being okay and then from there you can kind of fine tune it right you can take away the things that are inauthentic you can catch yourself and be more aware when you're acting under certain systems um and sometimes you you act under certain systems because you want to right that's fine um but you know that being content with being content piece was the biggest yeah. was the biggest change for me interesting um so one of my mentors used to say that um happiness and sadness are merely the high and low tides of a big 
sea of uh, and a big sea called contentment. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Perfect. Um, and and he works with his uh, he he works with his partner, uh, who I name check quite a lot uh, on the on the podcast, Elizabeth Ivory. Um, and our so she's mentored me and coached me, counselled me, therapy therapized me, whatever, uh, for years. And the stuff I got with from her was if we're okay with not feeling okay mm -hmm. right? to be so there's a difference well being okay with not feeling okay mm -hmm. because what we resist persists right so uh, i was thinking about that as uh you talked about anxiety you have less anxiety than you used to do and the first thing that came to me was maybe Brett's not fighting his anxiety like he used to do. So on the one hand, you've like you've got this anxiety, and 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 all you want to do is to be happy, right? So you've got anxieties in the way of your happiness. So somehow you've got to break through your anxiety to the other side, and then there's going to be this cloud parting moment, and you're going to find happiness. So the anxiety becomes a bigger and bigger thing mm -hmm. uh, and until the realization kind of melts it and you stop you stop resisting yeah, and, and and every emotion works that way um you know i firmly believe and it goes back to that safety piece right anxiety is a safety seeking emotion it's trying to predict the future it knows that it can't and activates your fight or flight system just like if you were facing down a saber-toothed tiger you know with a wooden spear um and it activates you in the same way. Even depression, in its own twisted way, is trying to keep you safe. Depression puts, uh, you know, the opposite of rose-colored glasses. You know, it puts, uh, <laughs> I use a more crude term, let's call them yeah. poop-colored glasses on your eyes. Um, and it makes you believe that everything has, is, and forever will be crappy. Um, because if you, if you only drop a little bit when something bad happens, because you already believe it's going to happen, you depression tells you that's going to hurt less than if you're doing well and then something bad happens so it's trying to keep it's trying to keep you from less hurt by kind of keeping you in hurt at a at a moderate level or a severe level all the time obviously it's it's misfiring and that's not useful um but all these emotions are trying to keep us safe which goes to your point when you ignore them or tell them they're invalid or try and push them away they're going to kick and scream until you pay attention to them because again our strongest driving force is to keep ourselves safe. So if your brain feels like you're ignoring the things that are going to keep you safe, it's going to scream its head off until you pay attention to it. That's one of the biggest things that I've tried, and we'll see if it works, um, try to teach my daughter when she was like two um, and still is, this is what anxiety is. This is how you talk to it. Here's how you can manage it. Here's how to show it respect, but you also don't have to do what it says. You can respect it, honor it, but you don't have to listen to it. Um, and that is what will make it calmer and go away in those sort of things. Um, and so even now it's been a couple of years now and she's kind of like annoyed whenever I bring it up. She's like, yeah, yeah, I know. I talk to it and I say, thank you. And then I go and do it, but I don't want to do what you say. Like she'll just like fire it off at me, but she's doing it in her head, which has helped a lot because she's, she has anxiety. I have it. My wife has it. She's great. She's got our brains. Um, so I was trying to get in there early to try and teach that, but you know, we need to respect the emotions that we have. The respect doesn't mean listening to them. Um, it doesn't mean doing what they say. We need to hear them and make them feel heard. And if you can make them feel heard when they're at a two, as opposed to an 11, uh, they won't feel the need to go to an 11 to scream until you pay attention to it. Um, which usually when it's up that high, it means you're being debilitated, right? You didn't go do the thing because your anxiety was so high. You didn't get out of bed because your depression was so high you know, all that sort of stuff. There's like chemical factors and all that sort of stuff too. But in general, right, if we can respect those emotions and respect their purpose, but not do what they say or choose whether or not we want to do what they say, that's where you can kind of get some more freedom from them and move yourself more towards that contentment. And that's exactly, you're right. You're saying that's what, that's what I did. And that is what I did. You know, when I'm anxious, I recognize it as my anxiety. I know myself well enough now. I've opened myself up to that where I can tell when I'm getting more anxious. I have things that are my signs before I even recognize it in my brain 
that I'm starting to get more anxious because of this, that, or the other. Um, and so, you know, to know that, respect it, and then know what to do about it um, is, is a huge gift. Yeah. So we're back to the addiction thing because um, you're, you're talking about not acting on the feeling, not fighting the feeling, not acting on the feeling, not acting on the thought. Whereas what I, I'm, I'm guessing the, um, when we do act on it, that's when we're going down the path to we're, 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 we're seeking safety. We're um, having that drink. We, uh, uh, and then we're having the next, the next one and the next one. That is that what this is all about? To a certain degree. Yeah. You know, there's addictions and symptom. Um, it's a symptom of greater mental health struggles. Um, and there isn't necessarily just one thing, right? But in general, and this is this isn't something that I feel is really important to understand and kind of fights the stigma around addiction is people aren't addicts because they're stupid. They're not addicts because they don't understand that it's bad. They're addicts because they have a problem that they feel is impossible to fix, and the only escape they can have is through substances. They found a way to temporarily treat whatever it is that's plaguing them. Let's say it's anxiety, right? They have such severe anxiety that badgers them day and night. And the only reprieve they can have from it is to get high or get drunk or whatever. Um, there's a lot of a lot of new therapy that says like, congratulations, you figured something out. You found a way to help yourself. Good job. Now let's find a better way to do it. Um, and I agree with that, right? Um, addiction is a disease of escapism. If we're not taught how to identify and deal with our emotions, we're going to find our own ways to do it. And there's nothing as immediately effective as getting high. There's no therapy that I can do that will be as instantaneous as shooting up or taking Xanax or getting a drink or whatever, right? It has very short-term effects and very long-term damages, but it is very quickly effective in that moment. Um, and so it's important to understand that they're not doing it because they're trying to hurt you or because they're stupid and they don't know that it's bad for them or, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's because they're hurting. Right. And it's different. There's, there's been like getting drunk, you know, and partying with your friends or whatever, and it becoming an everyday occurrence. There, there's a fine line between addiction and, you know, recreational use. But when it becomes that addiction piece, right, when the continued use despite the negative consequences starts to happen, um, it's th there's something else going on. It's not just addiction, right? That's not how it works. Yeah. The thing that popped into my head, I, I love that um, addiction is a symptom. I think that's so, that's so bang on the money. Um, mm -hmm. And the escapism piece as well, I think is particularly... Uh, useful and and I was thinking about you know more how society and cultures and I, I, I and I think the largely this from what I can gather that it's similar in the UK and the US uh, and the, the Western world probably so in Canada as well. Um, we've got there's these things like uh, uh, you heard this thing retail therapy, mm -hmm. retail therapy. You know it's yeah. like. Um, it will. It, it works. Yeah, it, it it works until you get your credit card bill, doesn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. very yeah. much so. And it's it's it, we call them cross addictions, right? It's not just relegated to drinking or smoking, right? We have uh, sex and porn addiction. We have gambling. We have internet, video games. We have you know all these different anything that takes you out of your reality for whatever period of time you can become addicted to. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm conscious of time. Is there anything else? Uh, as usual, listeners, check out um, the show notes for links to see what Brett's doing uh, and connect with him on the socials and stuff. Is there anything else that you'd like to, 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 to share before we bring it in? I mean, the, the only thing is, is, you know, one, again, I, I really appreciate you having me on. I mean, this is, you know, this isn't talked about enough. And only recently have, have I been able to expand the platform to be able to talk about this. So um, I really appreciate you seeking me out and inviting me on. Um, 
that's that's got me excited for the future of of how we can help. Um, but in general, for anybody that's listening to this that feels like they are struggling, right? Like go ask for help. Go find a therapist. If you don't like that therapist, find a different therapist. Therapists are human, just like you. So you may not get along with the first one. It doesn't mean that therapy doesn't work for you. It means that therapist doesn't work for you. Shop around, keep going. Any therapist worth their salt will completely understand and say, here's a list of referrals and, you know, God bless. You know, I hope you figure it out with the with the absolute intent that they want you to figure it out. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, if they don't, it may not be the right person for you, but therapy, there's a lot of stigma around it. There's a lot of stigma around addiction. There's a lot of stigma around taking care of yourself but please take care of yourselves. Um, you know, that's what this is for. That's what, you know, is going to help you move forward from this. And you are not just the one thing. You are not the trauma. You are not your adoption. You are not this. You are not that. You can choose what things you want to be part of. Um, so as always, you know, I appreciate you putting my info in the notes. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to direct, consult, coach, help, you know, whatever I can do to point you in the right direction or help you myself. Um, I'm always open to doing that and talking to other professionals, um, and coaching and training and da, 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 da. Like I want this out there. Um, so I am, I am always happy to help and I'm always happy to point people in the right direction because I get it. I don't get your exact story, but there is help and there is a way to move forward. Good on you. Thanks a lot, Brett. And, um, we will speak to you very soon. Listeners. Thanks for listening. Um, try now. Bye-bye.